Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. We have an update with Microbics Biosystems to discuss their Q1 2023 results. With me, I have Ken Hughes, COO, uh, Jim Curry, CFO, and of course, Cameron Groom, CEO. As always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the presentation on the website. And as Cameron just reminded me, we will have an updated presentation later on today. So feel free to check that out probably this afternoon. And as always, the session will start with a, an overview of the quarter by management, and then we'll get into some Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to input them in the box at the bottom of the screen. And I have received some in, in advance that we will address as well. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Cameron. Hi, Cameron. Hello. Good, good morning, Deborah. Thank you for uh, teeing this up. And thank you for joining us, as well as Jim and Ken. Uh, appreciate your support, as always. I'll just launch into it a little bit and, and make some points. I know uh, we've got a goodly number of uh, folks on the call, so th thank you very much. And we want to allot as much time as possible for questions. Q1 is simply a weak quarter. It is the weakest revenue quarter we've seen in about three years. And um, that was impacting each of the revenue streams associated with the business in different ways. Um, our CAPS business performed relatively well year over year, but uh, not what we were looking for due to some delays on the part of the major customer that we signed and uh, announced agreement with in August. Uh, they have continued optimizing their uh, certain of their tests far longer than we'd anticipated. So we did not have some validation orders that we were looking for in the first quarter that would have given us uh, somewhat better CAPS revenue numbers. In antigens, we had two uh, things. One was merely uh, scheduling of deliveries. We did not have certain deliveries that enabled us to recognize sales occurring during the quarter. And we had a margin, negative margin impact due to a supplier quality failure that caused a series of batch losses that although we would not likely recognize revenues from those batches in Q1, we certainly had to expense the failed batches in the quarter where we realized those issues have had occurred. And we have terminated use of, the, of that pro problematic product and resumed past practice so that will not recur. And finally, Ontario has re been rejigging its entire procurement system with the announcement of a new agency named Supply Ontario created at the end of December. So that has led to a pause in ordering of DR or DXTM products. So really, those three things led to a right light revenue number of 2.5 million for Q1 and, and frankly, just not enough margin, gross margin dollars to cover expenses and resulted in our incurring the first material net loss we've seen in, in some time. Perhaps I'll ask, uh, I'll roll through and then we can get into specific, more specifics around the quarter, uh, Jim, that you might choose to supplement to respond to any questions. So I'd, I'd say that that quarter is, is a poor one. Um, and sometimes this happens in a business, we don't have a perfect upward straight line in terms of our uh, growth and revenue generation for the company. And this is just that occasional bad quarter that happens. It is not, in our view, uh, indicative of any sustained negativity associated with the business. Quite to the contrary, we believe Microbics is still benefiting and continue to benefit from some very positive trends in the global diagnostics industry, and those being specifically renewal of broader testing activity as COVID goes from pandemic to endemic, we are seeing the return of a broader spectrum of testing, doctors seeing patients, patients seeing doctors, and this is leading to a resumption of demand for our antigens or immunoassay ingredients business that we see now returning to the closer to a million a month run rate that it had had prior to the pandemic. And in fact, for our major products, we see ourselves going flat out in that business now for the foreseeable future. And we'll start to see that impact in Q2 and forward. We're also seeing a broadening of the 
usage of molecular diagnostics, uh, just the same way many people did not know what an antigen was pre-pandemic or what PCR was pre-pandemic. Everybody certainly does know uh, those terms now. And we're seeing a broader application of PCR-based molecular diagnostic testing. That includes for rapid testing and screening for infectious diseases and also for such matters as cervical cancer screening, upgrading the means of detecting those by um, looking for the virus signatures of the virus that causes the cancer rather than waiting for the cancer to occur. And we're also seeing a, a accelerating uptake, I believe, of point of care testing. These can be um, instruments that are tabletop instruments anywhere from uh, the size of a uh, conventional uh, tower computer through to down to the size of a toaster and even down to the size of a brick, that being a conventional uh, masonry brick, that can conduct sophisticated antigen-based or PCR testing on a tabletop. So you can literally walk into a clinic, get a diagnosis definitively of what an organism is that is the cause of infection and direct therapy much more readily, sometimes referred to as a test, treat, and go philosophy, point of care testing. We see ourselves benefiting from all of those as Microbics is really supporting many of the Goliaths of the industry. Uh, we're not looking to be the David slaying them. Rather, we're looking to be a company that supports them with best-in-class services for the specific areas where we have expertise. So I would represent that uh, it should be expected for Microbics to continue securing new business with um, uh, large established companies and new and emerging companies across the spaces. We're continuing to target record sales and earnings, for, including for fiscal 2023, although with this week Q1, that will certainly be more back-ended in the current year. And a uh, few, few things I'll mention that, that have been commented to me specifically. One is just the level of commitment of management directors it's noteworthy that the SEDI system, the system for electronic disclosure trading by insiders, doesn't pick up all trades. So if management is exercising options and committing new capital to the business, that doesn't show up on SEDI. If we're having to sell a very few shares to pay cash taxes, that does show up on SEDI. And balances um, or on not on SEDI, but on some of the insider, the, the uh, online insider reporting systems. So one has to go deeper in and actually access the SEDI systems to see that. Looking at our annual information forms for the past three years, uh, 2022, which was filed in late December, 2021, 2020, I would like to call out that our six independent directors and three C-level managers that you see here have collectively increased our ownership in microbic shares by six, by about 6 million shares over the past two years. So we are very committed with our capital and with our skill and our efforts to continue building this business. I think you'll see that commitment continuing to increase as we move forward. And uh, if anybody has any questions on specifics, please do address them to, uh, to Deborah or to yourselves. Another thing I'll mention is just straight line tracking our EBITDA. Some people look at that non-GAAP or non-IFRS measure. That's great. And EBITDA is important, but it's not the end all be all because we are consciously increasing our investment in infrastructure. Some of that flows through the PL and is expensed. And this is specifically, uh, I'll call out not just investments in equipment, but also invest in investment systems such as our enterprise resource planning software that tracks the full acquisition of, of raw materials through to cost of labor, through to inventorying and releases of finished product. We are upgrading those systems along with digitizing our quality management system, tracking the so-called EQMS, in order that we can successfully scale the business and we do not have logistical cracks appearing in our systems as we make more of a wider range of products.
products. And these are not optional investments. These are essential investments. And they are absorbed and they do, in the shorter term, have an effect on depressing our EBITDA margins, but they are essential for enabling the kind of growth that we're targeting, moving from around the 20 million range to be able to support revenues of 100 million. Those cannot be done with paper-based systems and these investments we're making are not only um, prudent, but they're also necessary. And those benefits will accrue in um, in future quarters, in future years, but in the immediate term, it obfuscates the real strength that we're showing. Last point I'll make before we, uh, I'll ask Jim and Ken to make a few comments and then we'll move to questions, is uh, just to note, you know, we've effectively built two successful new business lines amid a global pandemic over the past two years, those being caps uh, much broader than the, the prior narrow segments to the proficiency testing and accreditation agencies that the company sold to in the past, but broadening that out to include clinical laboratories in Canada and internationally and to support directly major global diagnostics companies through in-kit inclusion and, and startup uh, onboarding kits, as well as the very successful creation of our DXTM viral transport. These are not trivial tasks to create uh, new $5 million a year business lines where they've ended in 2022. And I'd just like to put it in context as we look at a week Q1. Those are not trivial accomplishments that we've done. Now imagine as we're now able to travel, physically resume business development that people are looking at, resumption of more normal testing and patterns, just what growth our company will be able to realize on a going forward basis and to take a bad quarter into context. So um, with that, Jim, is there anything you'd want to supplement about Q1 or you know, our outlooks for into 2023? Sure, Cameron. <clears throat> yeah, Q1 was disappointing for us as well. Uh, and it has historically been our weakest quarter. So it's not unusual for Q1 to be a weaker quarter. I think with our core antigen business, I think that was the biggest impact in the quarter. And a lot of our orders are fairly large orders, and we don't control the timing of when our customers want these orders. And so we had a fairly low level of antigen sales, just over a million dollars. That is not representative of uh, historical or where we are going forward. And I would expect to see that, uh, you know, more than double or triple in the coming quarters for the antigen business. And again, historically, it's been our cap slash PT business that in Q1 has been the weaker part of our business. But in fact, it wasn't this time around. Our caps business continues to grow and we expect to see it uh, continue with that growth, growth trajectory. So I, I think the outlook going forward is strong. Um, we've just got, got to get through this weaker quarter and uh, start growing all aspects of our business. We're in a good position from a cash standpoint, so we can fund the growth. Cameron's talked about some of the areas where we're investing, <clears throat> so it has not the it has not stopped us from continuing to invest in the business uh, from a capital, as well as from some of these key operating systems that we've got the implementation going on in fiscal 2023. So I'm looking forward to the coming quarters and to showing much better results <clears throat> towards the year end, as opposed to what we've seen in Q1. Thank you, Jim. That's a, uh, a Great summary. I, I, th I think it's good that you call out that the Q1 previously had, you know, looking back a couple of years, had been a softer quarter due to the proficiency testing and lab accreditation companies. They typically run programs that test the labs three times a year. So our deliveries could be somewhat lighter in Q1 than, than the rest of the year. But we're seeing uh, very material revenues across our full, more fulsome spectrum of uh, of CAPS customers now, and uh, and more of a one-off for the uh, just the the scheduling of uh, antigen deliveries in this queue. Ken, what would you want to say? 
Yeah, <clears throat> from an operational perspective, I just wanted to extend what you were saying with regards to the investments we've made on a go forward basis. I've used the term, and we've all used the term capacity building a lot in various presentations we've made as we build that infrastructure to allow the growth trajectory that we're on, be that antigens, we've seen that's, that's expecting to grow and caps and VTM and related products going forward. So not only have we invested in capacity, we've invested in broad, broadening capability to diversify our product offerings. When we look at things like the ERP and the EQMS, and all the automation and scale up we put in place, including the facilities and trained individuals, we have the opportunity to build on from there and we intend to do that. So not only will we build capacity, we will improve capability. So we'll, and when all of those investments come to fruition, as we build, margins will go and efficiencies will get better. So margins will go up as a result. Where we, we've got the critical mass around 20 million where the systems we had can support it. But when, as we want to move on and we want to move on much higher than that, we need those additional capabilities. And that's where the investment is going. And we'll continue in that regard. And there are multiple opportunities for us to pursue going forward. And I'm really looking forward to reaping the benefit of those. We've diversified our technical and manufacturing capabilities and, and testing capabilities. And we're going to reap the benefits of that going forward in multiple product areas related to human infectious disease diagnostics. That's all I wanted to say. Great. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Were were there any uh, call outs you'd like to make specifically, or should we should we move to the uh, Q and A? Uh, I, I think moving into the Q and A makes sense because I already see quite a few questions coming in. Actually, this question came in, and you somewhat dealt with it with point of care, but I, I think it's worth touching on a little bit more. So the question is: Big picture, has the shift away from PCR testing and towards at-home testing created a bigger structural headwind than you previously thought, and thus go-forward revenue potential is much lower? I know you talked about point of care, but maybe you can elaborate um, on at-home. There, you know, at-home test. A lot of the at-home testing are, are different variants on on the immunochromatography strip tests like this, they are not considered diagnostic. Um, they are, they can screen a population if you want to uh, look and say, do I have flu circulating in my nursing home and you test 50 patients, you will find out if there is flu within the nursing home, but they are not considered diagnostic for an individual patient. And um, because the accuracy through the piece, um, through from the early stages of infection through to full symptomology is typically only on the order of 80% or four out of five cases. So we don't see a shift away from PCR testing or diagnosis. We see in fact an increased volume of PCR testing. Uh, and for respiratory, for example, the migration we're seeing is to the availability of fourplex uh, PCR-based testing in clinics, uh, schools, nursing homes, uh, you know, cruise ships, prisons, uh, where a portable PCR instrument can give a definitive diagnosis between influenza type A, influenza type B, COVID, and respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. So if folks go back through our records, you'll see that uh, in our news release disclosures, you'll see that microbics fully registered a four-plex CAPS PCR test control in December of 2021 in preparation for that migration that we, uh, we are now seeing. So you're having the product as a broad category, a full year ahead of the need, and then defining specific needs for individual customers with more tuned tests that are close to the sensitivity level of their tests, customized products that also develop there. So in fact, we're, we're, it's great to have at-home tests and you say, gosh, you know, but any number of times uh, I've heard people say, you know, I've used uh, boy, I, I, I tested myself four times before I tested positive on that antigen strip test. Well, there's a reason for that. And uh, for, for healthcare, which is the professional levels that we're supporting, uh, we see it very much remaining PCR based. Ken, is, is, that, is that an accurate summation? I would say that's, that's spot on. There are, there are uh, multiple opportunities and there are opportunities we were never involved in. But um, 
I think uh, the in, the business area that we're involved in is going to continue to grow rapidly. I've also heard that you can pour Diet Coke on those test strips and test positive for COVID. I don't. I don't, I, I don't know. Scale. I've never spilled a Diet Coke on a test strip. <laughs> I um, might try it out later today. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know. Well, well I see another question. Off? Uh, Deborah, did you want to curate questions or should we just take them as they come? No, I, I can keep asking them. I'll keep them thematic. I think because there's a lot of VTM, we'll just stay on the VTM theme. Um, so we were told that Canada still imported $50 million worth of VTM and related supplies before COVID. But that figure doesn't make any sense if they're doing zero. So how do we make sense of that figure? I'm kind of reminded of Mark Twain's comment. He said, uh, Truth is always stranger than fiction because fiction has to make sense. Some of the practices within within government are opaque at best. The figures of, uh, I believe it was 55 million, we'll round it down to 50 of imported BTM pre-COVID for Canada. Uh, I believe that to be accurate. Ontario is about 35, 36% of the population. So it should be approximately a third of that number. That squares with what intelligence we've had. We're aware that Ontario has qualified three suppliers of BTM. Uh, one is European, one is Asian, and one is Ontarian. And we are the Ontarian. So we'd certainly like to see, um, given all the discussion that's been had about the importance of supply chain security and the importance of the economic impacts of the jobs and the taxation that result from domestic production, we would certainly like to have the lion's share of um, production for Ontario. Uh, we believe that inventories are being consumed, but, um, but there, were, there are inventories to consume. Testing is still running, I think, seven to 10,000 tests a day in the hospital and congregate living settings. So even a third of that demand would be approximately what we sold in 2021 and 2022 um, in, in uh, dollars and units. So um, we would like to see that resume and we're committed to continue engaging at the highest levels to make that happen. But uh, you know, as, as self-important as we might be, we're probably not the very first consideration of an entire rejigging of healthcare supply chains in the province. So we can only uh, push as quickly and as, uh, as much as we can for this specific product area. And shouldn't Ontario have run out of product by now, considering that you expected a new order from them already a couple of quarters ago? When would you expect, to the, expect them to reorder simply taking into account the passage of time? I can't speak to what is presumed to have been expected, um, and we have not been given insight into the inventories within the different warehouses within Ontario. Um, there has been an immense uh, amount of turnover within all of these agencies and sub-agencies um, between the summertime and today, and uh, we know who the responsible uh, leadership uh, folks are, and we're committed to engaging with them to um, to get clarity into all these matters. And are you still in discussions with other provinces and other groups? Yes, on different levels. It has not been, frankly, our biggest management priority. There have been other uh, more urgent and higher potential uh, opportunities that we've been engaged in negotiations. With. Given the fall off in revenue, especially in VTM, Will you have to write off a lot of inventory? I don't think so. It's a, it's a possibility. Um, we do have a significant amount of inventory, some of which was built up strategically and some of which was to qualify our third site under our uh, ISO 1345 uh, certifications. Um, the product that we have now has dating extended out as far as 18 months. And it, as that starts to get short dated, um, we'll look at what um, at what and where it will be sold um, and look to avoid any write downs if at all possible. In hindsight, was investing so much of the company's time and money 
in the BTM build out and automation prudent, especially considering such a heavy reliance on a single unreliable customer? Can or should these resources be easily redirected into CAPS? Um, I would say with the benefit of hindsight, we would do the exact same thing. Um, we identified a uh, we identified a need, um, an urgent need for the province. We uh, came up with very creative ways of doing semi-automated manufacturing to satisfy those needs. We were provided very significant support from the Ontario Together Fund as a grant, uh, 1.45 million to do that, which was intended to cover 50% of the the, um, the cost of putting a full program, including automation in place. And we have um, received, if we recall, just under 9 million of orders from the province thus far with reasonable margins associated with those. So um, we've ended up accruing uh, net earnings associated with this program, and we'll have a first class automated filling line that can, can work on a number of different products, including with some re reworking uh, of mechanical jigs, uh, filling different file sizes. And uh, that could that could do BTM, that could do a bunch of different things. Yeah, just to supplement that, we, again, we've talked about capaci capacity building and capability building. Uh, building. We have a whole new portfolio of expertise in filling and manufacturing. We have a suite to do that, which is adaptable to multiple product lines. And to get to that point, we made a profit doing it. So, you know, we're well ahead on, on the investment we made anyway. So even if we were never going to get another penny, we're already way ahead, but we're going to get more pennies. But the point is the capabilities now in, in, in the company have broadened to a point where new opportunities are going to come down the line. So absolutely, it was the right thing to do. Okay, and then shifting gears into CAPS. So did any new, sorry, did any potential new CAPS customers walk away without signing a contract with you after you have been engaged in development work with them? If so, why? Um, I'd frame that slightly differently. We walked away from one potential CAPS customer that wanted us to do a lot of work for uh, no money and no certainty. And um, we said, thank you, uh, we, we have better places to use our, our time and our capabilities. One of the, one of the things in the, in the CAP side, point of care uh, PCR, the regulators are really looking at test controls, determining uh, not only outright failures of the instruments, but also degradation of the performance of the instruments. So if you recall the math of, of PCR testing, you're going through different cycles and each cycle doubles the detectable signal associated with, with the PCR test. Uh, regulators are really looking for the controls to be within five times the limit of detection of the test. So roughly two PCR cycles. Um, so relatively tight banding to show that the instrument is really performing to spec. And it's very, challenging for companies to do that to generate particularly swap based controls that are that tightly specced uh, into the instrument and it becomes that much more challenging when you're balancing between multiple analytes like the four plex respiratory uh, control that i've indicated so when we're doing that high that kind of high-end um, work uh, and creating these custom products we don't plan on doing that for nothing in, in terms of development, we don't plan on doing it for nothing in terms of margin. Uh, and uh, and if we can't come to an agreement with a customer on, on those terms, which we consider very reasonable uh, for what we're doing, then sometimes people may choose to try something different. Uh, and uh, so we won't be 100%, but I think we'll uh, be winning a lot more uh, than not. So, um, so, you know, it's a two way street and sometimes you have to, you have to teach people how to treat them as well. And can you please give us some numbers around the opportunities in cervical cancer screening and HPV testing? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, cervical cancer um, is directly caused by 
certain types of subtypes of human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus, it's a, it's a DNA virus. It's um, very persistent and has been in human populations for probably damn near as long as there have been humans. Um, and of the hundred odd types of the virus, 14 are known to be uh, definitively cancer causing. And um, cervical cancer was, was very, uh, very common prior to screening for cervical tumors and, and precancerous lesions using the PAP test developed in the 1950s. But of course, the, the PAP test is looking for cells that are already transforming into cancer or have been transformed into cancer. The molecular uh, testing for HPV moves that at least five years earlier, so that rather than uh, a tumor having developed, you're looking at people at risk of developing a tumor some years in the future. So it's a much better and more sensitive and less subjective way of uh, screening for cervical, screening for those at risk of cervical cancer. And uh, that's rapidly tracking upwards towards a billion dollar market. It's about eight, estimated at about 800 million, I think in 2022. And that's tracking up quite considerably now to control those, um, support quality control of those testing systems. You really need to have all or most of those uh, controls for all or most of those 14 high risk types of HPV. And that's a portfolio that Microbics has uniquely developed um, using, in fact, our own intellectual property um, and can readily create uh, those controls and are offering those broadly. And that's really why you see some of the support we've done, such as the announced support for Prince Edward Island, which is the first Canadian province to roll out human papillome virus testing now with a uh, small population of, of Prince Edward Island, it, in and it itself it is not that significant a uh, customer, it would be a few thousand dollars a year, um, but it builds bridges to the major global diagnostics companies and demonstrates to other provinces as well as other countries the support that Microbics product, uh, products and services can provide in rolling out their own um, HPD and uh, cervical cancer screening programs. So. Um, you know, a billion dollar market for HPD um, today may mean a $50 million market for microbics, uh, but we'll continue to grow with that. And uh, we see ourselves chalking up jurisdiction after jurisdiction, supporting different testing areas. And each one of those may individually be, you know, uh, six figure uh, accounts, but you start to aggregate those quite quickly, it becomes a multi-million dollar HPV franchise for us uh, relatively quickly, and, and we're committed to pursuing. So listening to what you said in the past, there seems to be a land grab going on for CAPS contracts. While you were able to secure contracts, are you aware of who your competitors and were they also able to secure CAPS supplier contracts? Well, it, it's interesting to uh, it's interesting to contemplate that. It depends on um, on exactly what uh, what we're looking at. You know, if if we're looking at a liquid form control that's uh, for an antigen test or thunderously positive um, in terms of the signal level, you know, somebody can bang that out relatively. Uh, relatively straightforward um, and that that I would expect to be to be more price based when we're looking at sophisticated multiplex uh, controls on uh, flocked swabs that are uh, temperature stable for multiple years and very tightly controlled close to the level of detection of the tests um, you run into problems with can you do it first of all, and then can you do it without violating microbics intellectual property rights or violating uh, copan intellectual property rights? So, um, you know, we, we may see some people um, trespassing on our territory. And if, if we do, uh, we'll decide what to do about it. Um, 
thus far, we're not headbutting uh, with anybody on, on the high end work. And any further clarity on when the single large cap order will begin? Uh, yes, I can, I can start to provide that. We believe now that specs have been locked in for um, some of the initial tests in that portfolio, and we're working with multiple projects. This is, you know, akin, uh, I use the analogy of a, I'm not a gamer, but uh, of video games. You don't launch a video game console and then just have Pong um, supporting it. Sorry, I'm dating myself. Maybe we'll move up 20 years and say Tetris. Um, still dating myself um but you don't launch that that console with just one uh application you wouldn't launch a computer nowadays with just one piece of software associate so using those analogies we're supporting multiple assays um uh, for a particular platform they are locking in the specs now of those those then start when specs are locked in with qualification batches where uh, usually three smaller manufacturing batches will be made to demonstrate lot to lot consistency. And then it moves into stocking orders for launch and then restocking and replenishment orders from there. So I expect we'll deliver some validation batches in the current order at ended March 31, unless I'm informed otherwise, but that's my current uh, knowledge. And then we will see um, further qualification batches for new assays in Q3 and Q4 and stocking orders for uh, assays in, in Q3 and Q4 as well. Jim and, and Ken, any, anything, I'm, anything I'm missing or you'd want to supplement or correct there? No, no. I mean, we're working closely with the, um, the uh, major... Um, yeah, don't name any names. Here. I know, no, I know. And, uh, you know, everybody... Has to, Outside of us has to deal with regulatory agencies and their own quality systems and things of that regard. But in terms of our contribution and, uh, and speaking to the uh, competition area as well, uh, what, we have a lot of proprietary expertise in this particular space and, and our client base is well aware of this. So we're working closely with them. So we'd expect things to move uh, quickly in the ne next little while. And certainly there's no problem in our shop and there's no problem in anybody's shop. But you know, in terms of the vagaries of the regulatory process, in global regulatory agencies and the internal quality systems of clients, there may be some stuff there or not, but uh, we will be supporting them going forward and expect revenues to pick up quickly. How many potential CAPS contracts are we talking about longer term? Are we talking about in the tens or the hundreds? Um, depends on the size. I, th I think in terms of large ones, you're talking, you know, you're talking about, um, well, you know, if you can go through sort of who the top, the top 10, top 20 companies in the industry are. Um, and then there are myriad small ones. So, you know, I, I think we have the potential to sign a half a dozen to a dozen um, contracts that, that would be in, uh, in the, you know, five to 10 million range likely. And then any number of small ones that would be in the hundreds of thousands to a few million. And you are still in discussions with multiple groups. Oh yeah, we we had uh, we had two two business development teams on the road just last week um, in in widely separated jurisdictions. So uh, these discussions are all you know are all proceeding and ongoing. But again, these are these are highly technical uh, collaborations, and they don't just you know happen at a bar over a handshake. And then I had a question about the multiplex. So if you have a control for a multiplex for indication test, does one control validate all four indications or do you have four controls for one multiplex test? Uh, be best practice is to, is to have one control for each signal. And there can sometimes even be also a, a fifth that's a sample adequacy control as well. So, um, you, you know, Tech, the best practice is that you're validating each channel or each signal of the test. And those also have to, it has to be uh, certain that those are not, those signals aren't interfering with one another as well, which is another element of, uh, of the, of the uh, technology. They've got to be loaded, stabilized, uh, and uh, non interfering. And that speaks again to our proprietary expertise. That's something we do very well, and our customers are well aware of that. 
Okay. So switching away from CAPS, um, what progress were you able to make in Kinlytic in the last quarter? Have you already found a partner? And what is the free cash flow opportunity per annum for Kinlytic for you? Well, you know, very, uh, very interesting on Kinlytic. The um, the word that we're getting is that there is a um, shortage of thrombolytic uh, material in uh, North America, Asia, and Europe. Um, and this uh, could be driven by any number of factors. It could be driven by deferred medical care. It could be driven by aging population post-COVID, other factors related to COVID. Um, you know, we will leave that to others to to determine, but uh, there seems to be very strong demand for both the catheter clearance indications as well as the systemic indications. And uh, this is certainly not diminished interest in Kinlytic, and we're continuing to work towards what we've committed to, which is a uh, partnership agreement that would provide uh, full third party funding for the Kinlytic program in order that Microbix is not taking away necessary growth oriented capital from our core business to drive that project. And what we'd like to see is an arrangement where we have some sort of upfront financial commitment to ensure their partner is serious, the ability for them to fund the project fully, uh, including the requal, all requalification expenses for the manufacturing, the clinical equivalency, and the product relaunch costs, uh, will providing us the potential to earn milestones and royalties. And best estimate is just the catheter clearance alone is uh, close to a $500 million market in North America. And if we were receiving a, uh, achieving a reasonable market share and a reasonable royalty rate on those, you could be looking at a revenue stream uh, to microbics in the 20 to 30 million per year range uh, for us. Uh, and uh, that that's an awful nice annuity to perpetuity uh, that could uh, be actually flowing to us within about four years. Are those Canadian or US dollar numbers? Uh, those would be US dollar numbers. Okay. And then I had a question on antigen. So in the shareholder letter, you write, much of Microbix's antigen production will be running flat out for the balance of 2023. How much of this future production will actually make up for the production losses in Q1? Due to the quality failure, and how much is actual growth? Is it a fair? Is it fair to assume that flat-out production can be associated with pre-COVID sales le levels, i.e., something to the tune of three million per quarter? I, I think that's a reasonable, um, a reasonable uh, ballpark level. Uh, we may not get to precisely three million in Q2, but it'll be a hell of a lot greater than Q1, um, and. Um, we'll see the impact of that. We are also looking at some uh, necessary price increases that we'll be putting through. But I think um, the, the the budget for the balance of 2023 fiscal is is much closer to three million a quarter than it is to one. Yeah, and, and the market is growing, although not at the uh, exponential rate of caps. So we're building that capacity as well. So when we talk about flat out, flat out for what we've got, we're adding to it and that's going flat out too. Yeah, quite right. So uh, we're, we're continuing to, uh, we're looking at adding to our bioreactor capacity as well as further um, refinement, streamlining of other processes so that not only we'll be able to make more, but, but get more margin out of what we do make. And that, and again, that this is very ticklish work, and it it uh, has to be validated and revalidated any process change before it can be put into effect. So these things don't happen overnight. And can you touch on some of those growth drivers for the antigen side of the business? Well, absolutely. One of one of the big ones is that uh, people are going back to see their doctors, and their doctors are willing to see them. Um, so that leads to people uh, getting more regular medical care and consequently more uh, tests being done. And uh, so that's one driver. Another driver is we're starting to see uh, Asia reopen. 
And you'll recall we've done quite a bit of business development work through our uh, distribution partner into Asia, where uh, microbics antigens were actually incorporated into the uh, regulatory filings for quite a number of tests looking for Chinese FDA approval. And as some of those tests now are are working their way through the regulatory process, we're actually um, starting to see, uh, we're, we're getting signals to say, get ready, it's coming. Uh, and uh, as those signals convert into orders, um, we see we see that unfolding as well. But I don't think too much of that blue sky is, or, or any meaningful amount of that blue sky is in the numbers that we talked about uh, over the balance of 2023. Okay. And then just going on to sort of general questions, um, Jim, I think this one's for you. Would you expect to be uh, free cash flow positive this year, including the drag from the difficult Q1 and what seems like another tough Q2? Uh, yes, I would expect this. For, that's for the year. Um, yes, I would expect so. Um, we should have a recovery from Q1. and. Um, I think Q2 is still to be determined at this point in time. I wouldn't think it's going to be a huge drag, um, but uh, certainly Q1 was, but I would expect to be free clash flow positive for the year. Okay. And then um, any indication that margins are coming in as expected for CAPS contracts, or did something change to the positive or negative as you get closer to signing new contracts? Um, no, I, th I think uh, what we're seeing so far is is satisfactory with regards to margins. Certainly, we're always targeting new product introductions to be at higher margins than our average current margins. Um, you know that that's just uh, sensible business practice, and uh, I've I've seen nothing to suggest that that is break of trend. Now, um, part of you know part of the development is of projects is uh, we like to align expectations on pricing with customers very early in the development process. So it's actually part of the um, user-defined requirements that are that are baked into our ISO uh, certifications that we have to ascertain that there's an alignment of expectations on pricing the product um, before we get deep into development. Um, and uh, both parties, you know, our customer has to say, this is gonna work in our marketplace and we have to say, we can manufacture this Create the product and make it at a satisfactory margin. We can't if we can't connect on those bases. If there's a misalignment, then the, the project just doesn't move ahead from very early days. It's a good discipline. You mentioned VTM not being a management priority. What are management's top three priorities for 2023? Great question. Um, I like that one. Um, one of them is certainly securing additional CAPS agreements um, and making sure that uh, the ones we have are unfolding as they, as they were. Um, second is to, um, I believe that we will uh, see some success at long last with, with Kinlytic, and we're committing a, a fair bit of effort on that from uh, business development support. And... Um, Third, I think we need um, we need to make certain that we have an anchor tenant back in place uh, with respect to our DXTM and uh, getting full clarity um, with regards to Ontario on DXTM um, and making sure that there's some longitudinal order flow from Ontario. And then we can, I think, responsibly reach out to other provinces. So those would be some of the things I'd be looking at as well, of course, as the broader um, logistical and operations side that you're um, successfully implementing the upgrades to systems and at the same time uh, managing our uh, availability of and use of capital, the, the capital that's entrusted to us by shareholders. Jim Jim, and Ken, anything I'm, I'm missing there or you'd want to add in? Uh, you're, uh, I mean, dr driving productivity in the antigen business on the upswing and making sure yep. that uh, our margins are maximized as a result, bringing in the various innovations we're working on right now to also maximize those uh, margins. Also, uh, using the capabilities related to VTM for new product lines in the same space and uh, addressing that. You made the comment about in the pandemic, we developed two big, big new 
product lines or are going to continue using new capabilities to build related product lines. Nothing, nothing tangential, nothing uh, out of the ordinary from our perspective with building on the capabilities we have. So they're going to be the focus, but I don't think um, DXTM is not a, a management focus. We just uh, we have multiple focuses that we've articulated before and we're pursuing them all in, with an appropriate vigor. And then I had a question just on the $100 million revenue target. Is that target still on the agenda? How long would you expect the company to take to get to that target? At least one quarter longer based on Q1. But uh, but kidding aside, no, this, this is what we're building. You know, this is what we're building um, the capability for. Um, you can't just ask people to work faster and, and do more. You've got to ask them to work smarter and, and give them tools to work more efficiently. So that's what we're really doing is making sure that we can scale without cracks appearing. You know, it's it's similar, you know, when we started with, with CAPS, for example, we were doing 100,000 files a year of CAPS that were manually filled. And uh, gosh, that was a hell of a lot of hard work uh, for everybody. And with VTM, further to Ken's earlier comment, we developed the capability of um, doing 100,000 files a week without killing any. Now, similarly with, with CAPS, we're at a position where we can do, uh, you know, really pushing hard. We can do probably 200,000 units a month uh, right now for swap-based uh, swap based CAPS. Um, some of our large potential customers may look at us and say, gosh, guys, show me how you're going to get to a million a month. Show me how you're going to get to two million a month. But this is the systems work we're preparing now to be able to, to demonstrate to big customers, we can support you. We have the ability, the plans, the infrastructure, quality infrastructure as well, and management infrastructure, manufacturing infrastructure to support you at these higher levels. If, you know, we, we could squeeze every penny out of today's EBITDA and never prepare for that. Um, or we can invest and be prepared for that and, and actually land those pieces of business. So that's the way we're running. So I, and I hope everybody sees that. I had one other question going back to the CAPS contracts, which I think is interesting. Do you already have more cop, I'm sorry, more CAPS contracts than we know of? As you once said that you were not just allowed to announce all of them or will you be able to announce all large contracts you close? We'll certainly announce anything that anything material that we um, that we put to bed. Um, we don't announce, you know, as a practice, we don't announce things that are not baked, that are not fully baked. You know, um, similarly, you know, somebody was criticized me. Why didn't you announce monkey paw, your monkeypox control when it was in the news cycle? I go because we didn't have a monkeypox control at that. Um, we announced it. After we've done the evaluations, we said this isn't going to be, we don't think this is going to be a pandemic. We do see a business case for it. We completed validations across 33 uh, independent sites and 11 different instrument platforms. And then we announced that we have a product. So we follow similar practice on this with regards to contracts. We have uh, multiple discussions ongoing in advance. And as we see those, executed as agreements and some of them may if they're not a formal agreement we, we won't have anything announced but the ones that get to a formal purchase and supply agreement and our material uh, will be immediately disclosed to shareholders okay we're coming up on the hour i have one last question for you cameron before i ask you if there's anything that you wanted to cover so i guess my question is like management's been buying the market recently which is great to see I also have been picking up shares coming out of a weak quarter. Like why, why should investors be buying the stock now? What catalyst can you point to? What news flow can you point to? Give us some positive things to, uh, to look forward to. Um, certainly we're, we are working our tails off to get uh, different things concluded and contracted and over the line. There's a lot of work going on in different jurisdictions and collaborations where microbics controls um, may be called to support 
even national level testing programs. And as, as some of those discussions come to fruition, we'll, we'll disclose specifics when it's signed, sealed, and in, in most cases delivered, quite literally. Um, and uh, we'll continue to work on uh, business development, work toward business development, a funded agreement on analytic, we'll continue to work on as well. And, uh, you know, broadly strengthening and improving the business. So I think, you know, we, we've actually had a pretty quiet period for news flow between, uh, between the fall of 2022. And that's not to say that there aren't a whole bunch of things brewing. It's just to say that they're still brewing. Uh, so when when those are uh, when those are, are fully matured and we're in a position to responsibly announce uh, formalized agreements, that's what we'll do. So uh, so I think I think the uh, the period of calm um, is is continuing to wind the spring of of, of uh, potential energy, and, and we'll hopefully see some of that released over the short. Okay. Was there anything that you wanted to add to the session that we didn't cover? Ken, Cameron, Jim? I've, I've got one thing, but uh, Jim and, and Ken, why don't you guys uh, go ahead? I was just going to comment that the fundamentals of what we're doing and the areas we're operating haven't changed. Yes, we've all we've just had a bad quarter, which is a, you know, something of a conspiracy of circumstance, but the business areas we're in continue to grow and continue to be opportunities. In terms of picking up stock, why wouldn't you? If we have one quarter and it's 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 down, right down at the bottom. I, I'm here for the long term to drive those opportunities forward. So, you know, I think there's a great opportunity here and that's why you should be in the stock. Um, if th this is not a pump and dump situation, we're building something real here. And uh, that's what I intend to be part of. Yeah, we haven't, uh, <clears throat> yeah we haven't changed our strategic direction. Uh, in some of these areas, as we've identified, we don't have complete control over some of these large diagnostics companies and the the testing that they go through with FDA. So while we'd love to know exactly when it's going to come to fruition, we don't. So we can, we can only go by with what is directionally indicated by them to us. And sometimes they don't meet their targets. And it's unfortunate and it's it's frustrating, but we still believe we're heading in the right direction with these vendors. Yeah. Oh, great, great comments, uh, Ken and Jim. And, you know, I, I'd uh, emphasize, you know, this this is a company that has built some very real and unique capabilities. We've got the, the human resources within within the broader uh, team, Microbix team. We've got the, the physical equipment resources. We've got the financial resources. And we're going to continue to put all of those capabilities to intelligent uh, use. For building shareholder value, uh, you know, as I said, uh, you know, you see um, all of the, you know, the, the independent directors and the senior level managers, and and down through the organization, um, all our commitment to the business, and uh, and that continues unabated. Okay, great. Well, I think that's a a good spot to leave the session. Uh, we did have a lot of questions both in advance and during the session. If anyone felt that their question wasn't fully answered, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to get an answer or set up a one-on-one -on -one call. Um, and yeah, thank you uh, to Cameron, Ken, and Jim for taking the time to, to do this session. And thanks to everyone who participated. Um, and again, feel free to reach out with any additional follow-up. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Superb. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Deb. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And Thank happy you. Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank think. you. I didn't dress in, in a bright color like you did, Deborah, but that's yeah. for the best, I think. Well, I figured I'd bring some levity and sunshine into the session. Good fun. Great. Thank right. you, everyone. Take care, Take care guys. everyone. Bye-bye.